Let me introduce uh, Professor Lenton, the Director of, of Global Systems Institute and Faculty Chair in Climate Change and Earth System Science at the University of Exeter in the UK. His reading of Jim Lovelock's books on Gaia while an undergraduate ignited his passion for studying the Earth as a whole system, forming the foundation of his research to date. For his PhD, supervised by Andrew Watson, Tim studied what regulates the nutrient balance of the ocean and the oxygen content of the atmosphere. In his first job, he built a simple coupled carbon cycle and climate model that led to the development of the Genie Earth System model. This led him to studying the coupled evolution of life and the planet and identifying tipping points in the Earth system, both past, present, and future. Tim and his group at Exeter focused on understanding the Earth as a system, modeling evolution, ecology, and biogeoengineering, uh, chemistry, sorry, providing early warning of climate tipping points and identifying positive tipping points towards sustainability. This integrated view of our living planet is captured in his books, Revolutions That Made the Earth and Earth System Science, a very short introduction. Tim has a lot to tell us this morning, so let's get started and we will hold questions. Put your questions in the chat and um, we welcome Tim. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Great to be with you all. Um, and. Uh, I can tell already from listening to the introduction talks that you're practical people trying to create change in these challenging times, and I salute you all for that. So as you can tell, I'm going to give quite a big picture talk, um, both about the bad climate tipping points that, that we're facing now, but also the positive tipping points in society and in technology and our relationship with it that I think we're starting to trigger and that we need to trigger more of if we're going to avoid the worst from the bad climate tipping points. So yeah, positive tipping points to avoid climate tipping points. Okay. We may not get into the specifics of uh, heat pumps, but I'll happily answer questions on that topic and other related technologies. I'm going to spend about probably half the time depressing or shocking you with the situation on climate change but then try to cheer you up for the other half of the time with the evidence that some positive tipping point change is happening. But let's, uh, let's maybe start with a, a small movie. I'm going to show a little movie uh, of a system that I'm forcing to pass a tipping point, or it will do in a minute or two's time. So this is uh, could be any complex system, but it happens to have two alternative states. It, it's only in, it can only be in one of them. That's the blue ball rolling around in the valley. But uh, as the godlike modeler, I'm forcing that that state of the system to be getting less stable, less and less stable over time. And at some point, a combination of that forcing and the small nudges and noise of the world um, tips the system from one state to another. And when that tipping point unfolds and we uh, see the system go into the other state, well, as you saw, change was rapid. In that case, it was difficult to reverse and it was self-propelling. I'll let the movie run once more through just to say a little more about what's happening. So when we cartoon any system as like the ball rolling around in the valley, we're saying that some damping feedbacks are maintaining stability. But as I force the system to lose stability, those feedbacks are getting weaker and some reinforcing feedbacks that propel change are getting stronger until they take over at, at the tipping point. And, and there we had it, that self-amplifying change into another state. Now that could have been any one in a whole range of complex systems or a kind of cartoon representation of a general tipping point in, a, in any kind of system. And here on these time and space scales, I've just tried to give a flavor of the range of Earth systems and ecological systems and some of the social systems and phenomena in which um, we already have evidence of tipping point behavior. We certainly don't need to go over all of these. They span a whole range of time and space scales. 
I'll probably start by talking about um, ones in the climate that happened before we started messing with the climate. So I'm going to start in a minute with ice age cycles. But uh, through the talk, we're going to get onto some of the red stuff, the tipping points in social systems. Uh, and I'll try to concentrate on some of the good ones, not some of the bad ones, because in the middle of the diagram is the, the big one to avoid, collapse of civilization, which, of course, has happened for every previous civilization in the past. So let's start in the climate and before humans mess with it. This is just the last 650,000 years of climate, which is a blink in the eye of geological time that sounds like quite a long while from a human perspective. Um, and it's the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere in blue as recorded in tiny bubbles trapped in ice uh, in a core drilled in Antarctica, and in white, the temperature, actually a measure of the temperature in Antarctica, but the global temperature is doing much the same thing. Uh, in this case, it's recorded in a kind of proxy of temperature uh, in the ice itself from Antarctica. And well, uh, if you, I, can, I can gather from the introductions that some of you have probably got some training in electrical engineering and systems. So even if I, hadn't told you that this was the trace of the climate system and the composition of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the temperature and i just asked you if this was this was a stable system or not well if you've got a training in electrical engineering or maybe maybe not on this call but maybe if you're a cardiologist you'd see that this was not a particularly stable system um, because it's undergoing what we call sawtooth oscillations for obvious reasons the shape of the oscillating curve. And those oscillations are the great ice age cycles in this, the climate system. And at the end of each ice age, things change pretty abruptly. The temperature shoots up and the CO2 shoot up in a kind of tipping point change that's self-propelling before the system each time around sinks back down into the next ice age. So this was just the natural behavior of the climate system before we started to hit it hard, if you like. So I'm arguing that it was actually probably unusually unstable, the climate, before um, we evolved all those uh, agriculture and all those civilizations just in the last little bit of the curves in the last 10,000 years. The problem is off the back of this rather unstable climate, naturally, we pushed the CO2 level, well, a bit higher than there now. It'd be more like 420 parts per million. And uh, if we don't change our ways quickly, in the rest of my lifetime, we we'll probably push it up to the top of the, the slide, if not off the top. And uh, you can see from the historical record how closely tied CO2 and temperature were. So we should have no surprises if this doesn't cause a profound change in global temperature. And why, and we shouldn't be surprised if it wouldn't trigger, well, potentially a bunch of tipping points in the climate, which are there on that map. And I, as I originally mapped them out in about 2008, I'll say a bit more about what they are and how the map looks now in a minute. Um, you might though be thinking, okay, well, where do we get evidence for the possibility of tipping points in the climate? And apart from that gross big scale picture of those whole ice age cycles, um, we can look, one of the places we can look is a, in a little bit, bit more depth into an ice age cycle. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm looking just, I say just, but just at just the last 80,000 years. So that's a fair chunk of the last ice age and then out of the ice age into what's called the Holocene interglacial. And I'm now I've switched from Antarctica to, to Greenland and a nice core record of, again, a measure of temperature, this time in Greenland. And the point is it, um, it changes abruptly and repeatedly. These are things that are known as the Dansgaard Oshka events, these abrupt climate changes. And you can see they've been numbered and there's at least 20 of them there. Um, they amount to abrupt climate change of the order of 10 degrees centigrade, even 15 degrees centigrade of warming within one or two decades, uh, not just in Greenland, but affecting, well, the whole planet, but particularly the Northern Hemisphere. So once again, emphasizing the point that the climate could be quite unstable, particularly in the last ice age and at the end of it. And we understand something about how 
those past tipping points were linked to reorganizations of the great circulation of the Atlantic Ocean, coupled to changes in the sea ice cover in the Arctic and the circulation of the atmosphere. We can even zoom in a bit on the last 30,000 years or so to see a bit more structure in all of these, these so-called Donskodoshka DO events. We don't need to dwell on the details, but hopefully it emphasizes that, oh, blimey, the climate uh, naturally had some significant instabilities in it. Um, and although these are high latitude records, um, if I was giving you more of a history lesson, I could show you records from the tropics of the climate of the past and also convince you that uh, in the tropics of the planet, um, there's quite an instability in the water cycle, essentially, and monsoon systems can switch on and off and have done in the past. And that's been linked to the rise and fall of past civilizations. So the past is one source of evidence about possible tipping points in the climate, but so too are the kind of complicated or complex climate models that people like me and my colleagues build and then run to look at possible climate futures. And it turns out that when you delve into these climate models, you find sometimes abrupt changes uh, at large regional scales going on in the models. And what this map does is just plot the locations of a bunch of abrupt changes happening in the climate models uh, in space. And then the color code is a clue to the temperature at which the abrupt changes happen. And the shocking thing there is, well, some of those colors are green and yellow. So in the model worlds, forced from the pre-industrial climate uh, up to the present level of about 1.2 degrees of global warming and then forced on further. Well, some of them have already shown some abrupt shifts around the present level of global warming. Uh, and certainly quite a lot of abrupt shifts are yellow there in the range of one to two degrees C of global warming. That's kind of summarized the same information on this plot here, where the x-axis is the uh, temperature increase, and we're just stacking up the instances of abrupt changes in the model world. Nobody who does this stuff for a living pretends that these models are perfect or comprehensive, or that we've captured all the relevant dynamics. So this is probably just a, a fraction or a snapshot of uh, the possibility space. Oh, and if you're wondering why there's no not lots of abrupt shifts at high temperatures, that's just an artifact of the fact that there aren't lots of scenarios or simulations going up to the high temperatures. Still, there's a pronounced cluster of kind of bad things going on in the model worlds at low temperatures. So that's uh, models in the past, but then there's observations of what we, the changes we see unfolding in the climate system. Um, and this is my like simplified summary of some of the striking changes that are going on in what I call the tipping elements of the climate system. The bits where we've got good evidence from the other sources, if you like, that there could be a tipping point in, in these different systems. And oh dear, we also have evidence for a number of them that change is accelerating in the wrong direction, including a significant slowdown of the great overturning circulation of the Atlantic, which will come back as a common theme. Also, significant acceleration of ice loss from Greenland and from West Antarctica. And in the case of West Antarctica, uh, it's hard to rule out that we haven't passed a tipping point for losing a significant chunk of that ice sheet that will give us over a meter of sea level rise on its own, could do stabilize the rest of that ice sheet, which is about three and a half meters of sea level rise eventually, and add on to that Greenland, that's another seven meters of sea level rise. And you start to see that we're making commitments for some future generations down the line to, to uh, reshaping the coastlines of the world, if you like. Well, I won't dwell on all the evidence in this of abrupt change that's actually seen in the observations, but it's for these reasons that uh, as a climate science community, we've been are uh, continually reassessing a sort of uh, risk assessment of climate tipping points in, a, in an alarming direction, which is to say that 20 years ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Assessments would have said we need four or five degrees centigrade of global warming before we've got a sort of significant likelihood of crossing some climate tipping points. 
as of a few years ago, um, the IPCC's special reports were suggesting, well, we're already in the danger zone at 1.1 or 1.2 degrees C of warming. Uh, we're definitely thoroughly in the danger zone before we get to two degrees C of warming. And above that, well, we're looking at these becoming high impact, high likelihood events. So that's the sobering uh, summary. And recently, a few months ago, we we chose to, to look again and try to reevaluate our map or our list of these candidate tipping elements in the climate. So here are some of them, which I call global core tipping elements, because if these things change, the whole climate, not all of us uh, no, notice it, or the whole climate system changes in some fundamental way. Um, and I've talked about several of these already, but we see big threats, you know, for major ice sheets, as well as uh, permafrost in the high Arctic, the Amazon rainforest, and two different aspects of the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean. But there's also a map of what I call the regional impact tipping elements, the things that, okay, you tip these, maybe you don't see a change as profound in the whole global climate, but my word, a lot of people would know about it and care about it. And that would include the loss of tropical coral reefs that over 500 million people depend on for their livelihoods, for example, but also the, the monsoon system in West Africa and its coupling to the vegetation in the Sahel, and, and the, uh, as we call them, extrapolar mountain glaciers. So what we tried to do a few months ago was get all the information we could from over, I think it was 230 Polish studies and synthesize what we know about how close are the tipping points for these various tipping elements. And that's what all these burning embers are. Quite a messy slide, but underneath, if you're seeing my digital laser pointer, you see a trace of the climate coming uh, that came up coming out of the last ice age, just as a reminder. And uh, also in the colors over here, a range of the different scenarios for where we might end up this century from the uh, pessimistic uh, uh, high fossil fuel future that gives us five degrees C of warming to the most optimistic scenarios, which may be limit warming to two degrees C. And then let's have a look at our burning embers as we call them. Well, the red, the yellow to red color scheme sort of expresses our uncertainty on where the tipping point is for any of these systems. Our black horizontal dotted line is our best guess. Um, suffice to say, at the current level of warming, we think at least four, maybe five um, major parts of the climate system are already at risk of passing a tipping point. If we get to one and a half degrees C of warming, which might happen in the next decade or so, uh, we've got four systems where we think there's a pretty, uh, where it, we would say it could become likely that you reach a tipping point. Uh, including those two big ice sheets and the low latitude coral reefs and a fair old chunk of the permafrost. And then, of course, I'm afraid it just gets sort of worse from, from there. So we don't probably need to labour the detail. The point should be clear that this is a serious risk. And at the moment, current global policies are taking us to about 2.6 degrees centigrade of global warming this century, which is the sort of thonking great black line running across there. Well, you can see how many risks we're um, going to be dealing with if we head into that world. And clearly, the lower we can keep global warming, the more we can limit these risks. Of course, the climate there is, like all complex systems, interconnected. And that treated these bits of the climate as, it, as if they were in isolation. But we know from Earth's history that they couple together. We know that even in our observations now that the, the coupling is happening, that the Arctic's warming up two or three times as fast as the rest of the planet because of the loss of the sea ice exposing instead a very dark ocean surface that absorbs a lot more sunlight. But that Arctic warming is a big contributor to the accelerating melt of the Greenland ice sheet next door. Arctic warming means more rain and snowfall in the Arctic, as well as more meltwater pouring off Greenland. So those are sources of fresh water into the salty North Atlantic Ocean, which unfortunately interfere with a process called deep convection, which is the, form the formation of waters that go from the top of the ocean to the bottom either side of Greenland and propel this amazing thing called the Atlantic overturning circulation. 
And so that's part of the story of why that's slowing down. And unfortunately, Earth history teaches us that when it slowed down and tipped in the past, it disrupts the monsoons around the tropics because it drag because you basically drag the great band of rainfall around the tropics southwards. Um, and at the same time, if you break or weaken that circulation, it, it, in its normal state, it takes heat from the southern hemisphere and the southern ocean to the northern hemisphere. Well, if you stop doing that, you you warm up the waters around Antarctica and can contribute to the ice sheets melting there. So in other words, you've got things coupled in a bad way that tipping one thing makes tipping another more likely. Um, we don't have a great scientific amount of study on the impacts of these tipping points, but um, we have done some work on um, the big one, if you like, which is a collapse of that Atlantic overturning circulation that gets referred to here by this acronym AMOC, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, it refers to. And here I'm just showing you what happens if that tipping point happens on top of two and a half degrees C of global warming, which remember is kind of where we're heading under current policies. Well, the world has generally been getting warmer by the, because of the global warming, but the tipping point can reverse that and cause cooling in the North Atlantic region. But the most profound thing is probably the effects on the water cycle over on the right hand side. You get in red is some extraordinary drying. This is the shift southwards of the band of rains in the tropics, red to, to blue, if you like. But that extraordinary drying extends not just over West Africa and the monsoon region there, but over the Indian subcontinent and monsoon region, over a massive swathe of Europe and including the UK, um, begs all sorts of questions, uh, for example, for our food supply and water supply and water security. So we started to take this simulation and dig into it a bit. We coupled what the climate model said for what would happen to the climate with a model of land use and farmer decisions in my home uh, nation, as you can see here. Um, and basically the story is it gets profoundly drier over the UK if this tipping point happens, and that would eliminate arable farming from the UK in simple terms. Um, that might be the least of our worries, though, because it gets so much drier that London in the southeast, where most of the people are in the UK, just doesn't have enough water. So you'd have a major water uh, redistribution challenge for the people of my country. Stepping out to the global picture, you can take the climate simulation and then you can feed it into a simulation of different major staple crops and where they uh, mo model for where they grow, their so-called niche and then look at uh, whether it gets better or worse for the growth of wheat, maize and rice. Worse is purple, better is green. Mm -hmm. Well, quick, quick glance at the map will tell you that there's a major problem for wheat production in this world of climate change and climate tipping point. There's a pretty big problem for maize production as well. Rice, it's a bit less clear. It's sort of some you win, some you lose. But we're really talking about major changes here that are additive. So global warming has a bad effect uh, on the area in which we can grow wheat, wheat and maize, but the tipping point has an equally or bigger bad effect and the two kind of combine together. So you more than half the area that's viable for wheat growing on the planet and a similar story for maize growing. Uh, I, that would be a major issue for food security on top of uh, water security issues that would be all over the place. So that, I hope, is enough about the bad climate tipping points to see what, what risks we're running. Uh, they should, that little uh, presentation should convince us that, blimey, we really, there is a really strong reason to want to limit global warming as much as we can. And this plot is about, well, what does that mean in terms of global greenhouse gas emissions converted to carbon dioxide levels emissions. Well, the green line is how those emissions have co continued to climb, although they haven't, they're sort of stable, you might say now in the after recovery from the pandemic, they're back to roughly where they were before. What they haven't done yet is this spectacular decline that they need to do if we're gonna limit warming with a 50-50 chance to 1.5 degrees C 
we need to go down that red line with the red uncertainty range around it. Or if we wanted to limit the global temperature, temperature and warming to two degrees C, we'd have to go down the blue line. In each case, it's a spectacular rate of change and reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions. I'm one of the people who's saying we should be trying our hardest to limit the warming to one and a half degrees C. That means halving great global greenhouse emissions this by the end of this decade, and then getting them to so-called net zero uh, by, by mid-century. So my point in the second half of the talk is the only way we're ever going to achieve that is if we could find and trigger some what I call positive tipping points that accelerate in a self-propelling way uh, change within society and technology um, towards zero emission systems, essentially. Now, that argument is not mine alone. Many, many of us scientists are coming to the same conclusion. And we're like sort of con conceptualizing the challenge a bit like this, that we're, we're still stuck in the business as usual state of the economy. But there are signs it's weakening, as we'll see. Uh, we need to get into this different decarbonized state of the energy system and the economy. There's some barrier to that change, usually. Although, as we'll see, the barrier is lowering. And it might need some particular actions or interventions to lower the barrier, to change the balance of feedbacks, if you like, and particularly to try and strengthen the reinforcing feedbacks that can create a kind of self-propelling change from one, uh, I would say now, undesirable state to a more, much more desirable one for society and technology. So to believe that we could tip positively the kind of rapid change we need, um, I think we need to convince ourselves that we've changed rapidly in the past, if that isn't obvious. <laughs> so to highlight that, I'm going to show you my um, distant relative Lillian Lenton here. Um, that photograph is taken in 1913, and you can probably tell from the number on her jacket uh, that she's in prison. And if you know your social history, 1913, she's in prison in London, you might guess that she was one of the most active suffragettes and is in fact uh, strongly implicated in burning the uh, tea house in Kew Gardens, the ground, as one of her protests, uh, trying to draw attention to the movement to give votes to women. Now, whilst in prison, Lillian was on hunger strike, many of the suffragettes were, and unfortunately, the authorities saw fit to force feed women suffragettes on hunger strike in prison at that time. And in the case of Lillian, they put the tube down the wrong way into her lungs. And they very nearly killed her by pouring liquid food into her lungs. She was then, of course, rushed to hospital. But the government said, oh, no, she's only ill and in hospital because uh, she was on hunger strike. It r rapidly became clear that that was a lie. And that was one of many events that turned public opinion against the government and in favour of the movement for votes for women in the UK, granted for women over the age of 30, at least, in 1918. Not much comfort for Lillian, by the way, because she was younger than that. She had to wait probably another 10 years before the vote was granted to women 18 and over in the UK. But hey, what a change, you know, doubling the um, democratically voting population uh, in the country, a pr profound and fairly rapid social change. And of course, more recently, we've seen this uh, extraordinary young lady start a massive climate movement by choosing to skip school on a Friday and protest outside the Swedish parliament. Greta Thunberg started a kind of tipping point dynamic, which because her action made it incrementally easier for the next person to join her in the protest, who makes it incrementally easier for the next person and so on and so on and the whole thing kind of effects snowboard if you like so that within months uh, in my country and in many places around the world we had millions of people marching for more decisive political action on climate change and then we had things like the european parliament pictured here declaring a climate emergency in november 2019 that vote so it was within literally within months that we went from lone protester to serious change in political rhetoric. But uh, Greta would remind us that the climate doesn't care about political rhetoric. The climate only cares about 
action that actually changes those emissions, greenhouse gases. So we've also got to be able to convince ourselves that technology and our relationship it, with it can change abruptly as well. So for that, a very famous uh, historical example, this is, I'm gonna show you a photograph of Easter Parade, Fifth Avenue, New York City in the year 1900. And your um, task is to spot the automobile when everybody is, else is riding in a horse-drawn carriage down the street. If you're quick, you might have spotted the automobile roughly just below the middle of the picture coming forwards on the right-hand side of the road. But 13 years later, if we look at a photograph of the same Easter parade, Fifth Avenue, New York, New York City, 1913, um, the challenge is just to spot the remaining horse or horse-drawn carriage with everybody else in an automobile. And interestingly, they happen to be in roughly the same position on the street. So a bit left and downwards of centre over on the right-hand side coming towards us. So that's a profound change in per personal mobility. Um, it happened in roughly that decade across US cities. It's obviously continued to spread around the world. Um, we'd look upon it perhaps in, with the benefit of hindsight as a depressing sort of one in terms of it, what it did for, for fossil fuel burning and, and greenhouse gas emissions, especially if you know that partway through those, those 10 or 13 years, there was a time when 30% of the early automobiles were battery electric with lead acid batteries. And apparently Thomas Edison is the one credited with talking his friend Henry Ford out of the electric car and into the internal combustion engine. Um, and the rest is history. Well, of course, the electric vehicle has been trying to make headroads ever since, and we'll, we'll see a bit about that in a minute. But I just want to sort of talk a burst more generally about how that's not the, obviously not the only abrupt past technological change. There have been a whole host of them. And in fact, the best data is from the US, where you see here the uptake of all sorts of new gadgets. But what this illustrates, these classic, we call them S-curves of of, in, of te technology diffusion at a pretty steep, you know, the uptake of new technologies usually, they illustrate that there are really strong reinforcing feedbacks in innovation, in technology, in its diffusion through society. So I list those on the side, but basically we, we have common language names for them. Learning by doing, the more we make something, the better we get at making it. Uh, economies of scale, the more we make something, the more cheaply we can make the next unit. And then something I had to give a name to, I call it technological reinforcement. But the more a new something is used, the more other new technologies emerge that make it more useful. So like complementary technologies, electric vehicle charging network, for example. Bringing me back uh, to a recent example uh, of a tipping point, finally, towards electric vehicles. And happening first in the country of Norway, of all places, thanks to some very early social activism from these characters. Now, these characters include Morten Harkett, the lead singer of the pop band AHA, one of the other band, band members in this red car in the background, uh, together with this character, Harald Rosvik, uh, architecture professor from Stavanger in Norway, and Frederick Hauger, an environmentalist. And they've just bought this red car, we'd call it a Fiat Panda, but it's a hobby converted electric vehicle in 1989 here. And they have bought it in the Bern in Switzerland and they're going to import it to Norway with a series of demands for the Norwegian government that they should waive the import registration tax for all electric vehicles. Um, they should waive road tolls for electric vehicles and they should do a number of policy things to enable the transition to clean electric transport in Norway, where even at the time Norway had almost like 100% renewable electricity from hydropower. Um, now, this was a pop band as well as some activists doing this action. So they were smart enough to work out that the media would be following their every move and would shine a light on their campaign to promote electric vehicles in Norway, which they duly did. And they basically shamed the government of the then 
uh, of the then Prime Minister Grohan and Brundtland, who was famous for the concept of sustainable development, into doing some acquiescing, shall we say, to some of their demands. So that started to create enabling conditions, a niche, if you like, for electric vehicles to develop in Norway, because first of all, the, way, the import tax was waived, and that's typically 20 or so percent of the value of the vehicle in Norway. And then after a long fight, the uh, road tolls for electric vehicles were waived, which was a big enabling condition. All of these things and several other demands they made and policy changes that were made fed into the fact that now um, Norway is the country where if you were to walk down the street, you see electric vehicles everywhere. And if you were to look at the data, you see that in just the roughly the last 10 years, um, electric vehicles went from a tiny market share to dominant. I mean, this only goes up to 2020. I think the latest data for 2022 would be 85% market share for battery electric vehicles in Norway. So an extraordinary fast transformation in personal mobility, one that has is not perfect, but my, wow, does a lot of good for the climate. Because if we can make this tipping point global, that's about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions right there from, from road transport. And when we looked at the data, and this was in 2019, we were curious to see, okay, how sensitive is this switch to people buying electric vehicles on the y-axis, the market share, to the difference in price to a petrol or diesel car on the x-axis? And it's amazingly, it really is a tipping point. It's as you have the, the price could be really close to the same for the consumer and they won't switch or only five or 10% of them are buying electric vehicles. But in Norway, where thanks to some progressive taxes, EVs were the same price to buy as petrol or diesel cars, suddenly everybody bought them. So a very perhaps simple behavioral tipping point, not the most rational one, by the way, because these cars run undoubtedly cheaper to run. So, you know, the tipping point should be at a point where they're a little bit more expensive to buy. But we're not the brightest uh, species, as we've all learned. <laughs> anyway, clear tipping point for electric vehicles. And the big question, of course, is how, how could tipping points like that spread worldwide? And there's one big thing coming to help this one spread, and that's the fact that economies of scale are making the batteries that are the key thing adding to the price of the electric vehicle cheaper, the more batteries you make and the more uh, electric vehicles you make. So the price of batteries has gone down about a factor of 10 in the last decade, and it's continuing to go down on average. And that's a, gonna produce a very strong reinforcing feedback. I've kind of talked a tiny bit about how in the case of Norway, social activists and policy could create enabling conditions and could tip that market. But the more markets that tip and the more other countries that do similar policy incentives and the more electric cars that are getting made and built, then the cheaper the next one is gonna to get to make or rather the battery is gonna to get to make. And then quite soon by many projections, they become as cheap to manufacture and then cheaper to manufacture than petrol and diesel vehicles. And then everyone will be buying them. So that all is right now, I think, becoming like a cascading tipping point, certainly where I am across Europe, as we look at the market share and sales data. And that's interesting and important in and of itself. But it's also interesting if you think about the consequences of having um, ever cheaper batteries uh, for other aspects of the economy. So some of those are sort of simple, like if you've got loads of cheap batteries, it's gonna incentivize um, light goods transport electrifying as well. Uh, but also at some point, um, the writing becomes visible on the wall for oil companies who, who will stop hedging their bets and commit to reinventing themselves as something else as they realize that they're current business model is unviable and they're sat on a massive amount of stranded asset, as it's called. We see some evidence of that happening already. And then finally, I think the most interesting one is how electrifying transport and everything else reinforces another tipping point, which is the big one to renewable power. Because 
obviously, uh, as you all probably well know, when you want to boil the kettle, is isn't always when the sun's shining or the wind's blowing. So in a near, if we're pushing for 100%, uh, near 100% renewable electricity supply, we need cheap storage in the grid or very smart grids or both. And cheap storage could take the form of batteries, plugged in electric vehicles, the rest. So let's, that brings me on to my second case of a good news story of a positive tipping point. Um, being parochial here from my home nation of the UK, um, we've shut coal burning out of power generation in just the last decade. It's the black line here, basically. And that in 2012, it was 40% of our electricity power supply. And it's it's sort of close to 0% today. And it is the renewables in the yellow, blue and green that have taken up the slack. And yeah, I haven't put my latest data in here, but you can see a lot of that change was already visible five years ago by the end of 2017. So how did that tipping point happen? And how did it happen so fast in the UK? Well, obviously, money, public money was being spent initially on um, this rollout of renewables, especially wind power is a critical one in the UK and increasingly offshore wind power in the North Sea. Um, now, incidentally, we're at a point where that offshore wind in the UK, not only is it, or wind power across onshore and offshore, not only is it about 25 or more percent of our power supply, um, it's now generating electricity cheaper than anything else, and even irrespective of the crazy recent gas prices. So it's now paying the public purse back for the investments made in this the interval of this plot. But to get back to the coal burning story, essentially, we got to a point in the UK where uh, there, even though coal is usually the cheapest fossil fuel to buy, once all the renewable capacity was used up on the grid, um, whether you would switch on a gas power station or a coal power station next was was fluctuating a bit. It was still usually logical and cheaper to go for coal, but it but all the government had to do was put in a modest price on carbon emissions just in the power sector to begin to shift those dynamics because coal emits twice the greenhouse gases for the same power generated as gas. And essentially, around the time of 2015, 2016, the people who were invested in coal burning were not making much money because the coal power stations were not getting switched on as much as they had been, um, as captured in this quote from a utility analyst. And then they started pulling the money out of coal anyway. And then that becomes self-reinforcing. So then the utility companies realize, well, the power stations aren't getting used. They're keeping, they're costly to maintain. Um, we get to the point of these irreversible tipping points, like the destruction of this coal burning power station in Oxfordshire in the UK. And there's a tipping point we're never going back on. So we've seen that here. And uh, we're, as we'll see in a minute, lots of other parts of the world are seeing um, the, the the tipping point away from coal power and then all, and then away from gas power. But in this renewable energy revolution that I think is unfolding around us, we also have other kind of reinforcing feedbacks like so-called social contagion. We tend to copy what each other are doing if we like the look of it. And there's plenty of evidence that social contagion is happening not just for electric vehicle uptake, but for uptake of solar panels on people's houses. Uh, the data, the little movie I'm showing for that now, is from the early mid 2010s. It's from part of Colorado in the US, and it's showing, you know, first time customers and then referrals to friends. But it's almost like a visual representation of the socially contagious spread of solar panels in this case. And I could have shown you loads of other videos of that happening. So. There's that reinforcing feedback, and then there's also stunning economies of scale for wind and solar power. So I'm just showing solar PV panels here, but they've dropped in price since about 2008 by um, more than an order of magnitude, as you can see on the plot. And they continue to decline in price so that they're not only generating electricity cheaper than anything else in most of the world today, but they're going to 
possibly, according to some analysts, be able to generate power at a quarter or a fifth of the price that fossil fuels ever have been able to within, well, by the end of this decade. Uh, that's the energy revolution happening right now. And that was that was visible even a couple of years ago. And this, this is a plot, uh, first half of 2020 data plot for what's the cheapest source of new electric power generation by country. Blue is wind, yellow is solar, gray or black is fossil fuels. And that was if you took out the subsidies or tax credits that sort of bias in favor of the fossil fuels. The writing was on the wall then, and it's if I showed the map today, it would look even stronger. Um, so I'm convinced the global renewable energy tipping point is, is coming and is spreading. Um, and I guess I've already made the point that there's a kind of reinforcing feedback loop between that and electrification. So basically, if renewables are now generating power cheaper than fossil fuels ever have, and they're only going to get cheaper, well, that's a massive incentive to electrify everything you can, not just cars, but, you know, whatever, heat pumps, yes, 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 light road transport, etc. But of course, if that incentivizes electrifying um, cars and, and road transport, then we get loads of cheap batteries that helps reinforce the transition to towards 100, near 100% renewable power system and so on. Because once then you get to a situation where there's so much cheap electricity, some of it will be getting dumped down um, to generate green hydrogen and green ammonia. And we've just started mapping out then how, how tipping points that are good could cascade through the economy. We're going to, this is a kind of messy plot, and a cleaner version of it is going to appear in a report uh, that we'll release in the next couple of weeks. But essentially, we've been trying to map out well, where are what we call the policy super leverage points, the changes that not only would trigger tipping within a sector, but could trigger cascading change across sectors. Um, so one of those would be push for battery, cheaper patch batteries in electric vehicles, because that will also cascade to power, as I've described. But for hydrogen, uh, the first market for green hydrogen is green ammonia for fertilizers. But then you get economies of scale as you do, uh, and that makes the hydrogen cheaper. That opens up a market for green ammonia and shipping, which makes the hydrogen even cheaper, which opens up the market for green steel and so on. I'm using up my time, so I won't say much about ecology because you're more kind of building folks. But suffice to say, there's a bunch of reinforcing feedbacks already out there in ecology. And then instead of working against them, if we learn to work with them, um, we might get, be able to create uh, some much more productive and sustainable productive food systems. Like uh, my example here is um, blue mussel beds, edible mussel beds. Very simple to put simple technology fences into mud flats, and then the self-organizing feedbacks of the mussel bed mean they spread out, stabilize the mud flats, create a great breeding ground, if you like, and you can sustainably harvest that source of protein. Huge benefits for greenhouse gas emissions, reducing land use, impacts on nature, the works. Um, I won't dwell on this example, but we've basically been using these principles to map out, okay, how, would, how could we create policy to encourage tipping points for things like switching to alter, so-called alternative protein sources, substitutes for, for meat? Um, and yeah, the take-home message is perhaps pretty simple. What can we do in the face of the climate crisis? Well, luckily, to be part of creating the positive tipping points, we don't have to put ourselves our lives at risk in prison on hunger strike like my relative Lillian Lenton did. Well, we do have to act as you all are doing and i think the most effective change we'll create is when there's an alignment between us acting in civil society with good with a good policy framework around it with the finance or the capital moving in the direction of the change we want and with the media helping us tell the story of change that we want and those are the things that can kind of create the enabling conditions for tipping and then trigger them so I shall wrap up and sort of remind you of the bad news that we're in a climate emergency and there's some, I'm afraid, some hard evidence that damaging tipping points are approaching, or some might even have been passed. 
And if we're going to limit global warming to the goal of what's called the Paris Agreement, well below two degrees C, we definitely need some of these positive tipping points to accelerate change. But hopefully I've convinced you that we're already starting to see evidence of those happening. And that should all give us back some sense of power in the face of an otherwise daunting problem, because I think we can all be part of, of the change we need. Thanks very much. We see a lot of uh, a sort of dramatic weather events mm -hmm. already at 1.2 degrees yeah. Celsius of warming. Are those going to accelerate even as we stay relatively low in the warming? Or what do uh, you foresee? I fear that we're seeing the evidence that the response is indeed not linear and that we're seeing, you might think of them as, new, sadly, new weather regimes starting to, to appear. Um, I fear that that will continue to be the case. And, and the heat dome in North America, um, summer 2021, is a, one of many, unfortunately, recent instances. So, yeah. That that uh, that that has also I wouldn't say completely taken the climate science community by surprise, but it's another classic case where I don't think collectively there was the expectation there was going to be such a clear uh, non-linearity and in the increased severity and instance of extremes. Yeah, and it 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 seems as though even now the global food food supply is uh, at risk yeah i mean if sometimes we're unlucky and you get coupled extremes that hit more than one bread basket inverted commas at the same time that was the case in back in summer 2010 when both russia and i think brazil were hit at similar times um unfortunately that that can happen again and we can say something about the changing likelihood of that but of course, we also learned through the pandemic that we've we've kind of got ourselves wedded to just in time supply chains, and that's not so smart when a when a super tank when when a massive cargo tanker gets stuck in the Suez Canal or whatever uh, suddenly we're suffering, um, and when a war and then when a despot starts a war in Ukraine, uh, which is a major food producing nation in Europe, we all. We all feel the um, the implications. So, yeah, I think we're all getting a big wake up call about the nature of the complex system we're dealing with. It's not just the climate; it's the social systems that we've constructed that aren't the most resilient in a in the language of a climate or an ecological scientist. But of course, there's things we can do to make much more resilient systems if we accept that some of the change is unfortunately going to be unavoidable. And that's the beauty of some of what you're all working on, right? Because passive house buildings and is spread of re cheap renewable energy and many other uh, things seen as climate mitigation innovations can often also be good for adaptation. They can be, you know, a logical part of adapting to climate change. You might say the same for, you know, more trees in, in urban spaces to tackle urban heat islands and the like both adaptation and mitigation it locks away carbon it tackles the heat island we have a few other questions that have come in um, oh yeah i can see them in the chat um we see many models for current temperature scenarios has anyone created realistic models with the potential rate of exponential warming yeah well there's a whole range of models clifton who asked the question there and some warm a lot more than others that's the uncertainty and what we call the climate sensitivity so some of them are getting alarmingly high levels of warming and um, others less so and i'm afraid we have only a the the data that we have up to present um includes both the warming of the greenhouse gases but also an uncertain cooling effect from the the, the soot and the salt and particularly the sulfur aerosols that came with burning the greenhouse gases and because we can't constrain the cooling that's intersecting with the warming we can't very well constrain whether we'll have a high climate sensitivity and higher warming future or a lower warming future 
So some of the models give much more than others in terms of that climate sensitivity. You're obviously, I think you're already alluding as well to the possible feedbacks that I touched on. Well, they're not perfect, the models, but they do begin to capture the release of carbon from the permafrost and calculate that that can add 10, 15% to warming within this century. So we'll keep, you know, the community keeps working on it um, and try to keep making the models more realistic. A quick question on green ammonia. Mm. Yeah, so what did I mean? By that, I meant that you, you use an electrolyzer to split water to create the hydrogen part of the ammonia, and you use an air separator to get the nitrogen from air, and you make NH3 out of those sources of N and H, air and water, basically, um, as opposed to doing what's called the Harvard Bosch process, using an enormous amount of fossil fuel to split the triple nitrogen bond and synthesize ammonia. Now, green ammonia is made in a few places, and because of the spectacular gas price of late, has actually been cost competitive where it is being made. Um, so that's what I mean by green ammonia. And there's a number of demonstrator plants going in in various countries. And yeah, it can be the most, if you like, best marketplace for initial marketplace for green hydrogen as we call it and green ammonia made from green hydrogen which is why i highlighted it um, so it's cost competitive with the fossil fuel alternative before ammonia as a substitute for bunker fuel in ships um, and in, and that's cost competitive before you start using hydrogen to directly reduce iron to make steel but ultimately they can all become cost competitive we think Although it really helps um, that the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, in the US puts in a big kind of um, price incentive towards green hydrogen production. I think we have time for one more question, even though we're slightly over time. Uh, Miriam asks, um, how can we take advantage of social contagion for positive tipping points? And I think you, you talked about points of leverage and how do we find those points of leverage, if you will, to uh, speed up change? An excellent question. Um, so we look, need to, if we're systems thinkers, we need to look for evidence of where we start to see reinforcing feedback loops where somebody doing something good triggers other to do, others to do something good, or we see the obvious evidence that a movement is starting to happen. They're not always easy to spot, but you can see signals of that. You, in Europe, you can see that, for example, in people starting to voluntarily reduce meat consumption. In the UK, that's gone down about 17% in the last 10 years. It doesn't mean everyone's turning vegan, although some people seem to be and some social influencers seem to be um, triggering that. So, but it could also be things like we have in the UK something called transition town movement that's sort of grown from the bottom up but is spread around the world. So I guess I would look for those signs of those instances of okay, social innovation that that becomes self-propelling and catches on, um, and that could be across across many domains. But also, I feel like maybe also, I'm not the only one here who's who kind of tries to participate in some of that um you know be part of the change you want to see if you like but yeah there's a lot there's a lot to do there I think and I'd love to learn from your sector and activities whether you all start to see people you know you look up to other organizations that are making the change first and you learn from them and you're inspired to do as they did or try and do better that's that's again a kind of social contagion i think for the change we need uh tim let me ask you one more question the last last question from chris miller um how do you steer the conversation <laughs> with climate skeptics or is it even <laughs> worth it to try given they're often shills or whatever difficult one chris in my experience like um I feel like things, the, the vibe is different on different sides of the pond, as it were, because 
I wouldn't say they're ever going to fully go away, the skeptics and the deniers, but over here in Europe and the UK, they're kind of perceived to be irrelevant now, can I put it that way? And no one's really listening when they're squawking. And I, I feel your pain if in the US, I'm afraid it still feels a little different. But I think perhaps the thing that will silence the situation is that the the, the stuff I highlighted, the declining price of renewables, the fact that the new technologies are both cheaper and better, that's starting, the, the raw economics of reinforcing feedback is starting to win the day. So maybe there's some skeptics and deniers just will never stop, you know, denying and being skeptical. But the forces of change, I think, are going against them anyway. Um, so they'll, I trust that they will kind of, kind of lose and we'll all benefit because <laughs> even if there wasn't the climate crisis, there could be lots of good reasons for making the great energy transition. So I don't know if that's an argument not to engage with them because as a sort of public speaker and scientist, I, I, I can and do. Um, but at some point, um, we've just got to, put our energies where the positive change is. And I certainly had the lived experience of having to expend a lot of energy, trying to kind of reason with people who for various reasons were never going to change their position. And at some point you have, in my case, you just have to say, it's not a, I'm just going to leave them um, and try, you know, and work with the positive change. Okay. Well, on behalf of the Best Center and the National Science Foundation and all of our sponsoring organizations, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Peter and everybody. It's been an honor to be with you. Um, have a great meeting together. Thank you.